Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, the Minor Prophets. During the great book of Hosea, Hosea in the Hebrew tongue meaning salvation. And overall, it is God speaking to us, giving us his ultimate plan of salvation. And he plays this by having Hosea go marry a harlot. Because that's what happened. That's why he divorced Israel as it is written in Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 8. And uh, with God himself becoming a divorcee. And so, but yet at the end, as you're going to see, as he shapes it and forms it. And it has a great deal to do with the end times, as you're going to find out in today's lecture. Chapter 8, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father. Great book of Hosea, verse 1, and it reads, Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle. He is the enemy. Okay against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Now, what does it mean when you see the brevity of this when you put the trumpet to your lips? It means sound the alarm. He's on his way. And of course, this is the, a type of Antichrist. That, uh, and he's letting you know that in the end times, he's going to come. And who, what is a trumpet for? It's to sound the warning, and watchmen are supposed to be watching, and that warning is supposed to be given. And how is it that they worked themselves into this predicament? They broke the covenant. They went against God's law. They wouldn't study his word. And um, he's not happy about it. Our father's not the least bit happy about it. Verse 2, Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. And, and as it is when Christ would say, when I return, many of you are going to come to me saying, we healed in your name. We cast out demons. And he said, I, don't, I never knew you. Just get on the way. I never knew you. In other words, there are two Christ. There's the true Christ and a fake. And this business of one verse revolving revs, that make their own traditions and never teach or warn that the false Messiah comes first and yet falsely teaches that everybody's going to be gone. You don't have to understand God's word. How can, how can you let a man tell you you don't have to understand God's word? I mean, after all, he is your father. It's his commands that give you salvation. So do you listen to God or do you listen to man? That's where the trouble comes in. He said, they're going to say, we know thee, but God doesn't know them. Okay. Verse 3. Israel hath cast off the thing that is good. Well, what is the good? The truth. The enemy shall pursue him. In other words, they cast off the true Christ and allow themselves to be deceived. Verse 4. They have set up kings but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and of their gold have they made their, them idols, that they may be cut off. That Who can cut them off? God can, without any regrets. Okay, well, I'm sure he regrets, but uh, he gives them what they deserve. Um, you can set up idols in what way? Anything that you allow to come between you and the Word of God can become an idol. That can be false teachings. That can be traditions of men. And anyone that goes with another message other than the one our Heavenly Father sent us is asking for trouble. Our Father will not, not recognize that. Verse 5. And he gives an example here. The calf of Samaria... In Samaria, meaning Watch Mountain, this is where the ten tribes in uh, Jeroboam 
the king at that time that they set up, you don't have to go to Jerusalem. You don't have to know about what God said down at Jerusalem. You can worship these calves right here. O Samaria, or Samaria hath cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be ere they attain to innocency? How, how long will it be till I can find one honest man out of the whole bunch? Okay. And, and it is kind of sad when people chase traditions and play one-upmanship and never quite get around to teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse whereby people can say, Thus saith the Lord God Almighty. Our, our Father is very jealous and vengeance belongeth to Him. And He gets tired of this. It hurts His feelings. And when we hurt His feelings, He does look for that honest person that will be honest with Him. And that person's going to have received blessings. You can count on it. Verse 6. For from Israel was it also, the workmen made it. Therefore, it is not God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. In other words, all false religion is going to fall. It's going to be broken in pieces, and those that follow it, well, how, how, how can I maintain a true course to God's truth? Stay in His Word. It's very simple. A child can understand that. You start listening to the traditions of men and you're going to end up out in Primrose Lane. Or you can have the truth, the true word of God. God finds that very pleasing. That's the person God is looking for to bless, to give success, to utilize, especially in this generation of the end times. Um, these people of the ten tribes listened to old Jeroboam. They made this king. He made two golden calves. And it's a long, hot trip all the way down to Jerusalem. Just stay here and worship in this temple. After all, it is a temple of God. What God? Two golden calves. And you know what? The people were sucked in by it. They, they bought it. They believed it. Is it any wonder that God dispersed them and scattered them all over the world? Is it any wonder that the first child he named Jezreel, which means to scatter and then to sow, for ultimately they will be sown, and truth will abound. Verse 7. For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk, the bud shall yield no meal. If so be it yield, the stranger shall swallow it up. In other words, um, what, what is this wind that they sow? That's hot air. That, that's all they talk about is hot air. There's no, and they're going to reap the whirlwind or a bountiful wind of nothing. It has no stalk. If you plant a seed of corn, you're going to receive grain. But idle words of change and promise and hope without ever an explanation of, well, what does that mean? Will get you nothing. An empty hand. It's like saying, work with one hand and wish in the other and see which hand is filled first, okay? Or something like that. But you want to be careful when you listen to windbags. And certainly, um, we're speaking on a spiritual level here. You want to sow the Word of God. That's what you broadcast. You sow the real truth, and you'll always be successful. Not the traditions of men, not hot air, not empty promises, but the word of God and the commandment of God. Verse 8, Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. They're going to be a busted old broken pot. What good is a broken pot? You can't put anything in it. It won't hold anything. It is absolutely worthless. And that's what God's... You know, what, God, what, you go back to the um, 
idiom where God says, I'm the potter and you're the clay. He makes that pot and he forms it to where it is a good pot. But if he so chooses and you cross him, it can become a broken pot right real quick. And it's good for nothing. You know, if there, there's one thing in archaeology in archaeology and digs, one thing that is plentiful is pot shirt. Well, what is pot shirt? Broken pots, they throw them away. They're worthless. They're no good. And and so it is that um, um, a broken pot can't hold anything. It won't hold truth. It can't retain truth. It can't uh, hold the word of God. It all leaks out. Verse 9. For they are gone up to Assyria. That's one of the names of, that's, that's the enemy. And it's, in, in Isaiah 14, that's one of Satan's names as Antichrist, okay? A wild ass alone by himself, Ephraim hath hired lovers. In other words, this is, this is a strange thing. It says he goes up and claims to be like a wild ass. A wild ass is kind of shy and likes to be alone. And But old Ephraim, the ten tribes, they have to hire lovers. Okay, They, they play the harlot, but they have to be the one that pays. There's certainly something wrong with that picture. And that's what um, God is saying. You, you can't buy friends. But even to this day, we still find ourselves as a nation trying to buy friends. It won't float, friend. Friends are with you because of loyalty. Not to be bought. Verse 10. Yea, though they have hired among the nations, now will I gather them, and they shall sorrow a little for the burden of of the king of princes. Um, you know what the burden is? It's real simple. The burden of the king of princes is taxation. And it, it says that they, they, they wobble and wreath under the load of taxation because of the false rulers that they place over themselves trying to buy new friends or vote in new friends. And the taxation is so heavy that um, they'll sorrow a little, just a little while, that's all. But it's, it's not a pretty thing. They twist and they quiver under the load thereof. Verse 11, because Ephraim, that's the ten northern tribes, the tribes that went over the Caucasus Mountains that settled Europe, that later call, moved many of them to this great nation, America and Canada, hath made many altars to sin. Altars shall be unto him to sin. Um, it isn't God that they go for. They absolutely build churches, build temples, but they never teach God's word in them. Our Father is not happy about this. Well, what do you mean they don't teach God's Word? We, we read a verse once a week. One verse? Is it in context? What's the subject? What's the, what's the object? How can you get all that from one verse? With one verse, usually if you're not careful, you got nothing. But our man fills in all the blanks. Oh, does he? Do you not see something wrong with that? You should let God do it. You should begin with the subject brought forth by Almighty God. Let Him prepare the object and let the truth flow whereby it is God that speaks and not man, not a windbag. I'm not judging anyone. This is the Word of God that they, they, um, they, they bring these sin offerings and pretty soon even the sin itself is a terrible burden to them. Verse 12, I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. In other words, a lot of people say, well, where did, this is God speaking. Where did God write to man? Through the pen of Moses. You think Moses made up the Pentateuch? 
Do you think Moses made, made up the Torah? God spoke. Moses wrote. It is the writing of Almighty God. It is his commandment. You know, in life, the choice is yours. You, you have the choice of listening to man and listening to man's explanation of why he does things as he does, or you can grow familiar with that that is written from God himself direct, especially since Christ rent the veil of the Holy of Holies from top to bottom. You can even go in and speak to him, asking for knowledge and wisdom and guidance, whereby you bypass those sin altars that, that means an altar where, um, uh, example, how can you listen to a man that would tell you, you don't have to understand God's word. Well, why? You don't have to understand the book of Revelation. Why? Because you're going to be gone. You would listen to a man and re instead of reading the word of God when Revelation means to make known or to uncover in any language you want to translate it in. You would listen to man and let him rob you of the letter that God has written to you, then you're going to suffer. Because a child can understand that the, our Father speaks. If you get rid of all the garbage, if you get rid of all the traditions that make void the Word of God and go directly to the Father's Word, you know, it is written, and we'll be getting there before long, to that great book of Amos in chapter 8, verse 13. Do you know what it says? The famine of the end times is for, and boy, it has come to pass that the famine of the end times is not for bread, but for hearing the word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And in, in, in the beginning of that old chapter, it speaks of, People trying to sell old wheat that's mildewed with unbalanced, with, with crooked scales. That is to say that would weigh out the bread. When you got the true scales, the word of God, not a bunch of hot air, but the word of your father that delivers souls, that, that stops uh, the harlotry of chasing, which is to say idolatry that will be rampant in these end times. What did he say in the beginning of this chapter to give you the urgency? Get that trumpet to your mouth and sound. You give that warning that the false one is coming. He's on his way. And you're not to be deceived. And the Father says, my law, my word is there to strengthen you, to protect you. Verse 13. They sacrificed flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings and eat it. But the Lord accepteth them not. Now will, now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They shall return to Egypt. That doesn't mean literally. That means they're going to go into captivity again. Captivity by who? The false Christ. Do you understand what was said there? They take the offerings that are made to Almighty God. And instead of giving it to God, they eat it. They absorb it. Through taxation and many other things. It goes. And God never sees any part of it. And you expect God to be happy about that? I think you could understand. Well, what, what is it that Father really wants? As we learn back in the sixth chapter, in the sixth verse, that God doesn't want your burnt offerings. He wants your love. Our Father wants you to love Him. That's why he has written you this beautiful letter. A letter giving you guidance and understanding whereby you can be blessed and be prosperous. It doesn't matter what nations do. As long as you're in the way and the right path with God, he will take care of you. He will guide you and direct you and protect you. 
I believe that with all my heart, that we have nothing to fear other than fear itself. As long as you love the Father, you're in His Word, and when He said they cannot harm one hair on your head, He meant it. Why? Because He loves you. Because out of all the misguided poor people, He has an honest person in you that seeks, and he, that's what He's looking for, that finds the truth, that finds the way. And He will never leave you, and He will never forsake you. Verse 14 for Israel has forgotten his maker and buildeth temples. Oh, there's churches everywhere. And Judah hath multiplied fenced cities. But I will send a fire upon his cities and it shall devour the palaces thereof. Our father is not happy. The citadels and the temples are going down. Okay. Why? Well, first of all, if you turn it, why, why did God tell Hosea to go marry a harlot? Because the whole world, as it is written in the great revelation, when the false Messiah appears, that that the Assyrian is only a type of, which this is only a type, and it looks forward to that time, that the whole world, as it is written in the third chapter of Revelation, the whole world whores after the Antichrist. Only God's elect that know the false Christ is coming first will not be deceived. That's why you put that trumpet to your lips. That's why you stand watch. That's why you give that warning. For we're that close. And you can sense the urgency in the Father's Scripture, in the letter that He has written to us as to how the end shall with the hourglass tipped and the sands of time running out, exactly how it's going to come to pass, there will be no surprises for God's elect. Chapter 9 and verse 1, continuing, Rejoice not, O Israel, that's the ten tribes, for joy as other people, for thou hast gone a-whoring from the God, Thou hast loved a reward upon every corn floor. In other words, th this is an agricultural feast. Okay. <clears throat> you make your harvest and you harvest anything and everything other than the true crop that God intends you to. And you even hire lovers and make a, make a, a whoredom out of it instead of sticking to the word of God. Doesn't, it doesn't please our Father. It says, um, uh, you go whoring from, away from, Yahweh, away from the living God. That's the wrong direction, my friend. And then they might run to him and say, we've healed in your name. You can understand why he will say, I, I never knew you. What are you talking about? Because there's a true Christ and there's a false Christ. Verse 2. The floor, that's to say the corn floor, the thrashing floor, and the wine press shall not feed them. And the new wine shall fail in her. In other words, blight will overtake. Um, um, what, what it is, it says their expectation shall be nothing but disappointment. Why? Because they, they, they feel they really are playing church. Oh, it's, he's my brother. We're all brothers and sisters. We get together and we have the church of jumping up and down. We have the church of lying down. We have the church of laughter. And we have the church of, uh, and I'm not judging them. But wouldn't it be nice if they all studied God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse whereby they could say, Thus saith the Lord God. Uh, you know, it, it, um, when you leave our Heavenly Father out of the equation, and you do not let His writing be paramount in your temple, in your harvest, then you're in a heap of hurt. You're going to hurt real bad. And, you know, uh, the 
title of this book, Salvation, there's only one Savior. There's no other way. And that's why it's so important that you remain focused and disciplined. You've got to discipline yourself. That's what a disciple is, is one discipline. Into holding that truth and holding that line, you watch your harvest that it fails not. Verse 3. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land. Well, they're not fit. Okay. But they're, they claim to be Christian. Well, which Christ? The Antichrist? That's a bad Christian that follows him. But Ephraim shall return to Egypt. He's going back into captivity. And they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. In other words, um, they're, they're going to have unclean things um, brought forth by the false Messiah. And um, the fruits of their thrashing floor are not pretty. It has everything that is distasteful to our Heavenly Father. From perversion to you name it. It's brought in. It's okay. All in the name of God and peace. You want to wake up, friends. We're in the last days. It's too late to be playing church. You want to watch what is written. Verse 4. God has given us an example. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 4. They shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord. Neither shall they be pleasing unto Him. Their sacrifices shall be unto them as the bread of mourners. That's like at a funeral time. All that eat thereof shall be polluted, perverted. For their bread... For their soul shall not come unto the house of the Lord. Um, and um, they only stay. They try to stay their hunger. They try to save their soul. When only God can do that. And God will not accept that that is a foreign to his word. That that is contrary to his word. You want to be real careful, my friend. You're in the end times. And of all times, it's the time that you listen to your Father and stay away from pollution. Verse 5. What will you do in the solemn day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? What, what are you going to do when, um, when the um, morning comes, that the return comes? Do you know what to do? Do you know how to serve God? Have you read his letter? Do you know what is pleasing to him? Verse 6. For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt, or to say captivity, shall gather them up. Memphis. Do you know what Memphis is? Memphis is heaven of the good. Okay. Oh, what a beautiful name. Memphis shall bury them. The pleasant places of their silver nettles, that's the wood, shall possess them. Thorns shall be in their tabernacles or in their tents. What it's saying here is weed's going to grow up in it. That's how God looks at it. It's not worth a hill of beans. Okay. It's worthless, overgrown. It's supposed to be a house of God. Verse 7. The days of visitation are come. It's going to happen. Israel, the, the days of recompense, and that that's, belongs to our Father, are come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. That's to say the false prophet. The spiritual man is mad, claims to be spiritual, for the multitude of thine iniquity and the great hatred. The great hatred for what? For those that teach the real truth of God's word. They, they are a hated people. And that's fine. That's understandable. We're in Satan's hour. 
And you can expect if you hold God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, you're going to be hated by the world and the would-be so-called prophets and the would-be so-called spiritual men. Okay. When you follow the true Father, the true spiritual truth, and um, it will be evil spoken of. Why? Well, it, because it's Satan's hour and Satan is coming as the false messiah. But they can't harm one hair on our head, not even in troubled times. You've got a, not one thing to worry about. Your father loves you. Verse 8, the watchman of Ephraim was with my God, but the prophet is a snare of a fowl and all his ways. he catch you in a trap any way you turn if he's a fake. Okay. And hated in the house of his God. Uh, and so it does. It's just one hatred right after another. Verse 9, they have deeply corrupted themselves. They've deprived themselves. As in the days of Gibeah, therefore he will remember their iniquity and he will visit their sins. Do you know what happened in Gibeah? A, a um, prophet or a man priest marries a young girl he goes to get her from her father and uh, she kind of ran away and went home and he on the way back through in the city of Benjamin he was going to spend the night out on the street and an old man came in from the field and he said you can't stay out here it's too dangerous there's perverts all over this city and sure enough by about dark here come the perverts they didn't want the wife or this man's two daughters they wanted the man and, and um, e anyway, that's why all Benjamin was almost destroyed, to kill all the perverts out of it. And boy, did it happen. That's what happened in Gibeah. He says, when you look around you and it's getting back to the days of Gibeah, you're going to know it. Well, I would say to you, look around you. We're, we're living in the end generation. What a fantastic time to serve the living God. One more verse and we complete. Verse 10. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness, like wild grapes. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. But they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves unto that shame and their abominations were according as they loved. They just really could not stick with the Word of God when it's so simple and so easy to be healthy and to be blessed and to prosper. You know, many people worry about the world prospering them. That's not true prosperity. True prosperity is to have God's love and God's blessings and God takes care of His own. That's how you find success with our Father and because when our Father truly loves you. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? 
please never ask a question about a particular church, reverend, or denomination. Let's don't judge people. You know, our Father judges pretty rigorously, but yet fairly, always fairly, you know. Even if, if you are trying, if you're trying to find truth and you're trying to please Him, He's going to mark it as perfect and give you advice and help by direction and by leading. You can always count on it. Why? He loves you. You that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Now, you got a prayer request, you don't need that number, and you don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He truly does. So let him know that you love him. That's what he wants most from you. Let's go to his throne. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, and touch, Father, these that have needs in prayer, Father. Now, in Jesus' precious name, thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and we'll get to some questions here. We're going to go with uh, Marla from Indiana. When, uh, and you're welcome, when Satan is tossed out by Michael and when he arrives at the Mount of Olives and pretends he is Christ coming from the heaven, or is he going to just show up as an adult? No, he, he's, he will uh, appear from uh, heaven on the Mount of Olives. He is supernatural. And um, uh, with no proof of being born of the womb. He, no, he definitely will not be born of the womb. Why? Never. An archangel or a cherubim are never born of the womb. Okay, never. Okay. They're a different category. Okay, a different, uh, I will use the word class, but be that as it may. Dick from Pennsylvania. If God has more power than Satan, then why is there so much evil in the world? Also, do you think a person who has a wicked, mean soul can still go to heaven because they believe in God? What, is, what if they ask for forgiveness but still act evil? Well, God is certainly more powerful than Satan, but do you know something? Christ did a beautiful thing. He gave us power over Satan. And he gave us a brain. And he wants to know that his children can cut it. And he expects his children to use that brain and exercise that power over him. Uh, he, he doesn't particularly care for wimps okay, or poor me babies. He expects you. Why, why when, when, when the demons were, um, uh, uh, who had possessed this man from the tombs why did Christ let them go into the swine? Why didn't he just send them back to heaven and have them dead, gone, killed? Because he wanted us to do it. He wanted us to have the power and the authority to see that, um, that um, we could overcome. So, um, and, and you know, a person that is wicked, wicked, they may claim to be a Christian, they're not. A Christ man reflects and follows the path of Christ. None of us are perfect. And some of us make big mistakes. But as far as just being wicked all the time, that's only somebody claiming to be a Christian. Okay, They haven't quite made the cut yet. Janelle from Texas. Janelle, sometimes um, people have a toxic imbalance or a chemical imbalance and they're not responsible for what they do. So uh, don't be judging your father, okay? Seth from Pennsylvania. Could you help me understand Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, the temptation of Christ, comparing the temptation to scriptures They state that state that God cannot be tempted. Because what, what was Christ? He was our teacher. Uh, you know... As it is written in Hebrews chapter 2, God's not going to ask us to do something he hasn't done himself, okay, through the Son. And, and um, Christ was teaching us how to withstand the temptation of Satan. Do, do you think Christ was tempted? You better read it again. He was showing us, 
And and you know something? He put himself at a disadvantage. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, which is the time of, uh, is of probation. He went the full mile there to show us, even in a state of hunger, he was still not tempted. And he cut a big wake for us to follow in, showing us. But the main thing you do not want to miss is that Satan is a scripture lawyer. Satan knows the word of God, only he twists it to suit his own desires and needs. And a Christian at least should be pretty well founded in the word of God. Or he could be caught in a heap of hurt. Naturally, if you love the Lord and you talk to him, he'll see that you're not tempted past what you're able to handle as it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Jeff from North Carolina, uh, kindly please answer the following question. Where, where the book of Timothy says of bishops and deacons that they should have one wife, does this refer to polygamy or to have never been divorced or neither? Well, it, it means just exactly that. It doesn't have anything to do with divorce. Because um, there are biblical reasons for divorce, okay? And um, so uh, it, it means at one time, okay? He can, uh, let's say that his wife passed away, then he can remarry and still be a bishop. Or let's say that there was reason for divorce. On, uh, we, we won't judge if forgiveness is given. Uh, then uh, so be it if it's according to God's word. So um, it, is a, it is a thing whereby a person must be well educated in the law of God and not be one that judges human beings without knowing both sides to every detail and judge it and arbitrate it according to God's law, not man's. Okay. Question two, if a church pastor has a severe stroke that left him incapable of preaching, praying, or reading the Bible, can such a person remain pastor of that or any other church? Some have said it was a move of God to remove him from the role. Well, I, I wouldn't say that. Things happen. But naturally, if a man is incapacitated whereby he cannot uh, te teach the flock, then it's... Um, it is time to to have another pastor or for him to retire, period, okay? That's, that's just the way it is. Uh, Leroy from Illinois, please explain why Judas Iscariot had to point out who Christ was. J Jesus was very popular and had many followers. He was obviously well known. I don't follow Elvis Presley, but I could identify him. Even without pictures, it is easy to see who the crowd is following. I tried to research everything I can about the Bible, and this is just a little thing that seems to have me troubled, and I pray you can shed some light. Well, I can give it a try. You know, sometimes you have to have a little experience in the actual deed of what they were doing. Let me ask you a question. These, this was not a Roman army that had intelligence to know exactly where Christ would be that night. It, it, it was dark. There weren't street lights at that time where he was. They had no way of knowing where Christ would be at that night. You know, the country is a pretty good sized place. But Judas knew exactly where he would be. So it was not to only that uh, he was to identify him, but he was to lead them to him away from the people. Okay. That was necessary. It had to be away from the people so they could take him without an uproar among the people. After all, it was a little old ragtag army that the disciples themselves, if Christ had allowed them, could have whipped the whole bunch and sent them packing. Okay. But it was time and it was meant to be. And it was biblical. And Judas really was of the mind that Christ would force, he had his 30 pieces of silver. Okay? 
and he identified the Lord. It was dark, but he knew him, and he knew where he was, where there were no mistakes. So uh, I would advise you, Leroy, you go out some real dark night and make your mind you're going to go to a certain person somewhere without getting yourself in trouble and try to figure out where he is when you could have had a betrayer like a traitor like Judas that would take you right there, okay? You got to you got to use common sense and understanding. John from Florida. Where in the Bible does it tell us that the antichrist will not be a politician? Well, you um, naturally he is not a politician but a religionist and you can document that in Revelation chapter 13 verse 11. The first beast is political. It's the one world system. But the Antichrist, when he appears, is a religious beast. It looks like, I mean, he's got two horns like the Lamb of God. Sounds like, you know, looks like the Lamb of God. But it's the voice of the dragon, meaning it's the Antichrist. Religionist. Also, where does it say, don't be afraid that the end times are near? Well, um, Luke 21 it's a profile shot of the end times of how God's elect will be delivered up and how that they can't harm one hair on your head. Luke 21. Pastor Murray, what are your thoughts on the Bible code? Bunch of malarkey, okay? Don't pay any attention to it. Um, okay, I think that'll do. Um, John from Massachusetts. I'm embarrassed because I used to know the answer. Could you please explain what Simplify means? God bless you, um, your staff, and the United States Marine Corps. Well, Semper Fidelitas, it means always faithful. It is the motto of the United States Marine Corps. Salute. Okay. Um, Judy from Georgia. I heard somewhere in the Bible it talks about someone receiving a deadly wound in their head, but it doesn't die. Where can I find this? And who's it talking about? It's talking about the one world political system. It's got many heads, all right? It's political. You'll read of it in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. It's where the wound is received. And verse 4 is where it's healed, okay? By the dragon, which is to say none other than Antichrist himself. Uh, Marlene from South Carolina, will you please explain who the us is in Let Us Make Man? I was under the impression that the us was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I thought you explained it otherwise. Please clarify this for me. Well, where did you come from? And what image are you in? Okay. Uh, did you, you hatch out from under a rock out here somewhere? Or were you created through, uh, born from above through the bag of waters in your mother's womb in the image you were when you were with Christ. This is why that when Jesus would say, because you see, Christ was Emmanuel, which is to say God with us. And I'm using God himself as an example here because Christ would say, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Because he was the exact same image. Only we're in flesh. But we are in the same image as our spiritual bodies were. And we were, every one of us was with Almighty God when he said that. And when the first earth age was destroyed, it was at that time that he brought us through this earth age born of woman. Everyone must be born from above. And um, to make his or her mind up, are you going to follow Satan or are you going to follow the Lord? He sent the letter telling us exactly how to overcome in all things. It's your choice, your life, your boat, you sail it, okay? Um, Victoria from Mississippi. Uh, I'm confused about how God destroyed the first earth age and the catabo. Uh, not sure if that is spelled right. Well, it's not quite, but I understand. W would you please clarify this for me? Thank you. I'll be listening for the answer. Well, uh, God loves his children. And as it is written in Revelation chapter 12 
a third of God's children followed Satan, the old dragon. That's who the Satan is. Okay. And God had a choice. He could have killed Satan and a third of his own children. But have you ever thought how tough it would be to have to kill one of your own children without them having every last opportunity to overcome, to find, to find salvation? So instead of destroying his children, whom he loves, he chose to destroy that earth age, as it's written in 2 Peter chapter 3, and as it's written in Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning with verse 18. He destroyed that earth age and brought in this earth age where each person is in the image of God, born of woman, innocent, not remembering anything about the first earth age, who they loved, who they followed, but to serve God or Satan, their choice. Now, Naturally, the election comes into this as it's written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Some he chose before the foundation of the earth, which is to say the katabo, the Greek verb. And, and uh, he chose them. Why? Because they never gave in to Satan there. And as God's elect, they are not going to give in to him in this end generation when he comes as the Antichrist. God can move and interfere in their lives to bring Scripture to pass as it is written because they've already been judged. Okay. That is not to say that if one of them messes up, God doesn't slap them around, thump their gourd a little bit, I will say, to straighten their act out, but they are God's elect. And that's why he did it, is to save his children, to give them a chance. Then comes the third earth age. Read just from New York. I have a question. In the new millennium, what will become to our flesh bodies which we, when we turn into spiritual bodies? Different dimension. Okay. It is totally a different dimension. You know, it's very difficult to understand from the, to explain rather, from the Hebrew. But as you've probably heard me say in the past, I could teach almost the full book of Revelation from the 14th chapter of Zechariah. Well, Zechariah kind of tells you in the different dimension what happens to the flesh bodies. You can read it for yourself, but understand, flesh is just that. Our real body is a spiritual body, and the flesh body will go back to the dust from which it came, okay? And, uh, and your real body, which is far superior, if if you make the cut, we'll have eternal life, okay? Uh, Steve from Virginia. I have questions concerning the Canaanites, descendants of Cain, whose father is Satan. Are the Canaanites a peculiar, particular race of people, or are the Canaanites anyone who follows Satan's practices and don't believe in or worship Jesus Christ? You are... Um, you know, it is very difficult in pronunciation when you're teaching to teach the difference. This is why many times when I say Kenite, I'm not saying Canaanite. Okay. Kenite is a different Hebrew word altogether. K-E-N-I-T-E. -E, okay. And in the Hebrew tongue, that means sons of Cain. Canaanites, as you are spelling it, means the children of Canaan which is a fine young man. He was the offspring of, um, that was driven into another land. Why? Because Ham saw his fa uncovered his father's nakedness, which means he slept with his mama. And uh, as, as we know that to uncover your father's nakedness is to lie with his wife, okay? And this is why not God, but Noah drove Canaan away. So the Canaanites that you're talking about, you would really be wrong and you would never get anywhere in research. You got to, I want you to go back and I'm simply going to, again, spell it for you so you can take your strongs and get back on the right track with the right people. K-E-N-I-T-E -E means the offspring of Cain. They are sometimes even called the tares. As, as Christ would call them in Matthew chapter 13. Um, but the Canaanites are children of God. Okay. Patricia from Kentucky. I would like...
for you to explain Genesis chapter 9, verse 21 and 23 for my husband. It's, it's ironic how one question follows another. Um, Genesis chapter 9, verses 21 23 speaks where Ham uncovers his father's nakedness after he got a little bit intoxicated on wine. And your husband needs to read Leviticus chapter 20, verse 11. Anyone that thinks they understand what looking, you know, it, it's not a pretty sight for you to look at the old man's naked body, all right? But it's not a sin. Might be a little embarrassing, but it's not a sin. Okay. The figure of speech to uncover your father's nakedness means to uncover his wife, your mother. Okay, and and um, I'll give you another scripture: Leviticus chapter eighteen eight, or Leviticus twenty eleven will remove any doubt or any wonder about uh, that statement. Okay, and, and kind of explains the whole thing. Um, many people teach that this would change one's race, and that's ridiculous, okay? That's, that's not a natural thing. Uh, God created the races the way they are on the sixth day. I am out of time. I love you all because why? You enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Most of all, God loves you for it, okay? That's why He sent you the letter is so that you could understand his wishes, his emotions, his feelings, his love for you. Okay, Don't forget to tell him that you love him. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. But most important, you need to do this. You need to stay in his word. Set a little bit of time aside each day. Stay in his word every day in it, even with trouble. Still a good day. You know why? Because Jesus is a living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.